<laughs> Thanks. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, so, Ronnie, you have a very rare distinction of uh, early on in your life having struggled both as an actor and as a musician. Yeah, well, see, I grew up... Uh, I'm, I'm going to put you on speakerphone if that's sure, okay. Sure, absolu Just... absolutely. Can you hear me now? Absolutely. Yeah, this is much better for me. Uh, see, I grew up in a little town in New Mexico, Portales, New Mexico. But when I grew up there, in the, I was a teenager in the 50s. And um, 19 miles north of me was Clovis, New Mexico. And Clovis at that time was a hotbed of recording. I was actually around when P Buddy Holly cut Peggy Sue. Wow. I was there. Oh, my goodness. I was cutting records when I was in high school. Norman Petty saw a singing group I was with. Uh, when I was in high school and hired us to sing backup on records. And I had a, I had a rock and roll band back in those days. <laughs> Ron Rockouts. <laughs> so so I, I always wanted to be an actor, but I was also a musician at the same time. So I was a theater major in college, but I played music, putting myself through college. And then when I was struggling as an actor... Uh, I was, and I got deliverance largely because I was at home with a guitar in my hand. And that was my first, that was my first film. So I, I've, I've been a musician and, and an actor my whole life. Um, you know, let's get, you mentioned deliverance. Obviously that was your first job in 1972. I mean, you were alongside Burt Reynolds, John Voight, and a uh, little trivia for my audience out there. That was also your first movie in Ned Beatty's. Ned Beatty's first film, too. See, we were cast totally independently of each other. They didn't know we... And Ned and I had been best friends for like eight years and had already done like 25 plays together. So, uh, and, and probably, Deliverance is probably the first time in the history of film that they actually found the two guys below the title, that were billed below the title before the two guys, you know, generally they get the two big right, stars. Right, 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 right. Yeah, no, I was the first actor they found, and the next one they found was Ned, and Ned and I waited around for four or five weeks until they decided on John Boyd and Burt Reynolds. Now, where did they find you, Ronnie? Were you in L.A. or New York? No, I was in New York. Uh, I, see, after we got after we got out of... Uh, out of uh, college we went first of all we went to washington dc because my wife had a my wife has a had a phd in chemistry from georgetown she was on a scholarship there and i i started my theater career at arena stage in washington we were there six years and then after six years mary had finished her phd and she had a postdoctoral fellowship in new york at sloan kettering and so then i went to New York and was doing Broadway and off Broadway and Shakespeare in the park and basically a struggling actor. And Lynn Stallmaster and Warner Brothers came to, to New York looking for good unknown actors and God knows I was unknown. <laughs> and, and they went by Joe Papp's theater and, and asked if he would recommend that they see, and he recommended that they see me. And I was actually the first actor they saw in New York, not because I was at the top of anyone's list, I was so far at the bottom of the list that they asked me to come in for a pre-meeting <laughs> to, <laughs> to see if I, and so I went in and met, and then eventually I met with John Borman oh, three or four times during that week, and eventually they, they flew, I think, 12 or 15 of us out here to California and tested us for the four leading roles. Uh, and I was the only one out of that group that they liked. And then a, a couple of weeks later, they were testing in New York, and they found Ned there. And, and then, then Ned and I waited around for another four or five weeks till they found John and Bert. Well, I mean, how intimidating was it? I mean, just the, just the, the landscape where you guys filmed it, I believe in North Georgia, I mean, it must have been a horrific shoot. It, it, you know, it's fabulous. To me, I mean, first of all, it's my first time in front of a camera. And, and, and Ned's first film, too. So, it, And we're both, I'm from New Mexico, Ned's from Louisville. 
And, and in many ways, it was hard to remember that we were even making a film because, <laughs> you know, we, we did all the, the canoeing ourselves. No stuntman. And, no stuntman. And, wow. and, and you get in that water and you, you're just going down the river every day. It, 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 it was hard to believe we were even doing a film sometimes. We were just out <laughs> being Boy Scouts. <laughs> right. uh, you know, and what what the director did for that film, he shot this film in sequence, which is very rare. Yeah, yeah. This is one of the few films, because the reason it's rare in films is generally the, the budget is the bottom line. Right. Is, um, and if you have a, a, a character, I mean, let's say you're going to be in, in, let's say you're going to be in, in your office there for three scenes in the movie. Well, you're going to be in your office and shoot all three of those scenes at the same time. Or if you have an actor that's, that's in this scene here, this scene here, this scene here, well, you're going to try to shoot all of his scenes at once to get so that he's not on the payroll all that time. Well, see, the thing about Deliverance, Deliverance is a film that goes, that starts at point A and goes to point B. So you're never in the same location twice. So you, and, and it had a hidden asset aspect for, with, with that, by shooting in sequence, if, if one of us ripped a shirt, you didn't have to worry about working, not hiding that the next time, or, or having a different shirt. Right. You could play, so you you could just or one of us banged our knee on something. You could limp, <laughs> <laughs> and so it, it paid off in many ways. Like you say, there was your, your first film. It's nineteen seventy two. You got Burt Reynolds. You got John Voight. I mean, you're in one of the most iconic scenes in cinema history. Yes. I mean, you know, how do you comprehend that, your first role? Well, you know, first of all, you know, uh, (laughs) none of us thought it was going to be a big... uh, (laughs) Right. In the book, you know, they play play Wildwood Flower uh, in the book, which is a much simpler tune. And John Borman found uh, the, the name of the actual original title is Feuding Banjos, and the reason it's called Feuding Banjos is because it was played by two banjo players, a four-string and a five-string banjo, trading licks back and forth at a folk festival. And John Borman heard that and, and wanted to do that song. And so, and to tell you the truth, when we were doing it, Eric Weisberg, who played the banjo for the for the soundtrack, along with Steve Mandel on the guitar, Eric Weisberg came and said, "Why are we doing this piece of crap? Let's do something good." <laughs> <laughs> uh, and 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 you got to realize too that that very few bluegrassy kind of songs had ever been big hits. Uh, I think Bonnie and Clyde and Oh Brother Where Art Thou are about the only two that have had sort of uh, iconic bluegrass music in them. And and so none of us thought about the song becoming a huge hit as it did. As a matter of fact, when the film came out, there was no, there, there wasn't a record out. That, they played that scene, the dueling banjo scene, on television twice. They played it on the Ed Sullivan show and some wow. other show. They played it on the show because they didn't have anything else to play it there. Wow. Wow, unbelievable. Amazing. Um, that scene, Ronnie, uh, Billy Redden, they, from what I read, they, they picked him out of his, his classroom, the casting company, casting directors. Because the they, way- they looked at a whole bunch of kids. You know, Billy... Billy's wonderful. You know, he doesn't play the banjo at all. You would never know it. Uh, it's not even his left hand. Wow, uh, uh, very good. In the, and so he was he was picked. First of all, he, he, uh, he, he's not retarded, but but he, he has that look, right? That, right. That, that 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 everybody and 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 he was cast for his looks as much as anything else, and for his hippish sense of humor. <laughs> and, <laughs> right. and, and, and so, obviously, uh, when Billy and I were 
playing it. Like I said, it's not even his left hand. We don't even have real banjo strings on the banjo. Uh, they, they had sort of rubbery bandy kind of strings on there so that he wouldn't hurt his fingers. And But the problem is John Borman wanted to be able to cut to somebody's fingers playing the right notes. So Steve Mandel, who plays the who is the guy on the on the recording on the guitar, taught it to me note for note. So that so if you go back and look at the film, I'm playing every note that's there. I, he taught it to me note for, and I had an agreement with John Borman that if I missed a note, I would tell him and say, "Don't cut, don't cut to there," because I'm so if. if I'm playing the song, so is that, did I play it? Yes. Is that me on the soundtrack? Over the years of people seeing, see, seeing a character I was playing, and they said, oh, this is a good guy, this is a, and he wanted Dick Jones to be a guy that everybody thought was going to be a good guy, and then when he was evil, was twice as evil. And, and so... Yeah, I read the script, and I tell you the truth, I read the script, and, and the script in many ways was, was ca kind of cartoonish, and not that, not, it wasn't a script that knocked me out, but then I went in and met with Paul Verhoeven, and I saw his vision of that film. He's the one that made us care about that. He's the one that brought the humor to that story. He's the one that that that, that brought all those elements. So so it's the first time I've seen where where you take a, a script it's okay. Right. But you get a master director that has a point of view that knows that's when you that's when you, uh, you get a film because now you know, RoboCop has become a cult film now, and, and is a fantastic film, and that's due almost completely to Paul Verhoeven. Yeah, when you get a great director with, like you say, with a great point of view, it you know makes everything seem in the way you know it's the way it should come together in his vision. Yep. Yeah, that's great. I mean, it's a great film, a great you know, great eighties film. Another great eighties film you did. Your first big role in a in a big budget film came in nineteen eighty four as Lieutenant Bogomil in Beverly Hills Cop One and Two. I mean, that was huge. I mean, I was pretty much growing up in that era, and that was that was a monster films. It was it, it was it was great. It was the first time I I'd, I'd ever been in a film where we all knew that this was going to be a huge hit. And, and there's something about knowing that you're there, <laughs> just know that you're, that you're in a big, huge hit movie. And, and I don't know if you know this or not, but you've seen the movie with the Sly Stallone, uh, Cobra, right? Yeah, Marion Cabretti, yes, Cobra. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well... See, my former agent, Dan uh, Petrie, wrote, uh, Dan Petrie Jr. wrote that screenplay, and, and, and originally, Stallone was going to be in it. Wow. And, and they sent him the script, and he sat back, and he said, okay, here's my rewrites, and he, this is how he wanted it done. And, and the, the agent said, no, we're not going to do that. So then Stallone walked and did Cobra from his script, and they got Eddie Murphy to be in, in Beverly Hills Cop. Wow, and the rest is history. I mean, because Eddie was pretty much, he was on fire. This was the first of He had just done that thing with Dudley Moore. Uh, oh, yeah. Where he was in the tank. The tank, yeah, yeah, yeah. I forget the name of it. And, uh, you know, he was just breaking out. Right, he was right. It. And this and, was, go ahead. And Marty Brest directed it, Simpson and Bruckheimer, Fabulous. Marty Brest also Fabulous. he also did Midnight Run, I believe. Yep. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and this was any he, he was like this was like his first in a, in a string of seven number one box office hits for him. I mean, he just took off and uh Yep. I mean, did he Eddie add lib a lot, Eddie? Did he add lib a lot? All the time. Oh my the goodness. The hardest thing to do <laughs> working the hardest thing to do when you're working with Eddie, I've done three films with Eddie. I, I, you know, I did Cop 1, Cop 2, and I also did a little film called Imagine That uh, that I did with Eddie. 
And I love working with Eddie, but the hardest thing working with Eddie is not breaking up and making noise because, because, you know, you're there to feed him his lines and he's saying all this stuff and you can't keep from breaking up. You just can't. <laughs> I had John Ashton on as well and he told me the same, pretty much the same stuff. Yeah. Yeah, he's a, yeah, it must have been a great show. I mean, how did you even get that role? Did you audition for it? Did they, you know, they write it for you? Yeah, no, I auditioned for it, and I auditioned late. Uh, uh, and I'll tell you an aspect of that, too. They were having trouble finding you. That often used to happen to me was when they couldn't find uh, I wasn't a big enough name that, that that I was the name they were going. But when they couldn't get the one that they wanted, they finally just decided to go with the best actor. <laughs> and, and, and so then I went in and met with them. And uh, but here's something I'll tell you about Beverly Hills Cop One. Uh, and, and this goes back to this the luxury of shooting in sequence. Uh, the when we were doing Beverly Hills Cop One, the first scenes I shot in the entire movie were me telling the big lie at the end of the movie. Oh wow, wow! And that's the heart. Try try doing your homework for that because in in that speech you have to encapsulate inca- in, in, in the whole sort of right. Uh, journey that they've right. gone through as characters and the the, the, the ins and outs of, of, of we like each other that we don't so to to get that all into that scene that's some of the hardest homework right I've and, ever had to do you know and a lot of film goers out there when they go see movies that you know neither nobody realizes that that you know the like I had a gentleman, yeah. I had Frank Severo on was in a Goodfellas in the scene. He was in the scene with the coffee pot with Joe Pesci shot Samuel Jackson. He said, Mike, that was the first scene we shot. And it's like, it's like in the middle towards the end of the movie, you know? And yeah. It, and it, it, you, like you say, you got to, inco- you know, incorporate all that dialogue that you <laughs> read into your head. That's where your homework comes right, in. Right. That's, and, and, and that's the reason I, I have very little, uh, patience with people who who have to become the actor and then you have to do this because because an actor has a whole lot of things he has to be dealing with that in addition to to just being that character you have to say how am I doing is this working is that, am I hitting my mark am I doing all these things you got a whole lot of homework that you've got to do that has nothing to do with the with the guy you're playing you you have to find out what he's about yeah. but you have other things to worry about too. Right, and this was a big, big budget, so you know there's a lot of money involved here. So you better be good. Yes. Um, uh, this this talks about uh, Beverly Hills Cop Four uh, through Netflix. Did you hear about that? Netflix. Uh, the, They're making. I, I think Eddie might. Have, I think Eddie signed on for Beverly Hills Cop Four. Through- yeah, when we were doing Imagine That, the the executive producer on Imagine That had the rights to Beverly Hills Cop 4 and came to, to came to me and Eddie and asked if we'd be interested in doing Cop 4. I told him I had zero, zero interest in doing Cop 4 then. This was, hell, 10 years ago, uh, or at least eight years ago. And uh, I wasn't in Cop 3, as you recall, right. even though I even though I was offered it, I read the script. I I, I hate sequels. I, it, I, this is a bad joke, but I'll tell it anyway. <laughs> making making sequels is a little like putting on a wet bathing suit. <laughs> I like that. I like it, Ronnie. <laughs> it's true. It's true. You know. Um, so you're out for four. No, I am not going to do four. Okay, okay. And, I, you know, Ronnie, like I mentioned in your introduction, and you are an incredibly talented, I heard a lot of mu- your music, you're an inc- incredibly talented musician, and that's your, your, your love. And you will not... Well, let, that's what I've been doing for the last right. about so, 10 years. So <laughs> let, let's say you read, you read another great, you read a great script. Somebody sends it to you. 
you will not take it unless you can do your music. No, that's not true. That's not true. If, uh, if I'll I'll do a script if it doesn't interfere. Right, right. Sorry. With any music. Now, lucky last year I did I did Nashville, and I got to do both. I got to sing and act. And the year before that, I did a little television movie with uh, Willie Nelson called Pure Country, Pure Heart, and I got to pick and sing in that and that and act. Uh, so. But see, my show, I'm also, as you can probably tell from this interview, I'm a storyteller. So right. my, my show is really more like, it's more like acting with, it, with music in it, too. I, I, every, yeah, every, you, break, you break through the fourth wall. Every song has a story that goes with it. And so... And so, so I get to use all my chops. And the thing I love about the music shows, I, I love acting, don't get me wrong. <laughs> but I don't love it quite, quite as much as, as music. Acting, with acting, there is and must be that imaginary fourth wall between you and the audience. You can't step through the camera and talk directly to the audience. You've got to stay within the confines of the play, even though you're doing this. With the kind of show I do, there is the possibility. It doesn't always happen, but there is the possibility of a profound one-on-one -on -one sharing that I can have with the audience, so so that we we can have a shared evening, and that is an opiate that is undeniable. Yeah, it's magic. It's magic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, ironically, your Stargate fans are huge fans of your music. Yeah, they are. That was so funny. There's a there's a there's a guy Brian Cooney who ran MCM Expo in London for years, and they used to do all those Stargate conventions. And and as you know, on Stargate, I was the most hated man in their <laughs> universe, <laughs> Senator Kinsey. Right. And so, and see, I, I, I get invited all the time to all of these because because of RoboCop and Total Recall and Stargate and Star Trek and and, and I've I've just been in so many of these iconic uh, sci-fi movies that I I get invited to all these conventions where people sell their autographs. And I have to tell you the truth I don't like to sell my autographs. I, I, I I'd rather give them away. Now I don't I don't want right. to I, I don't want to deprive, deprive other people who make a handsome living going and doing that. So when Brian Cooney called me up and asked me if I would be willing, to watch, the way they can get me to go to one of these conventions is to hire me and my band, they're, two, they're a small band, and let me do a show uh, for, for everybody, and then I'll sell them my autograph or, and my, or CD or whatever they want. So I, the first one of those I did, I, you know, here I am, the most hated man <laughs> that they know, right. and, I, and, and this is the truth. I know this sounds hokey phony. I couldn't get off the stage. I, 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 we finished our last song. They they stood. They they wouldn't let us. So we had to go back on a play for another. And I, they love my music. So what can I tell you? Uh, that's fantastic. Then speaking of your music, where can people go listen to your music and purchase your music? It, you, you can go to go to my website, RonnieKosh dot com. And if it, 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 there's, I've done ten, eleven, twelve albums, something like that. I've got, I've got a brand new album that's just about to come out, and I, I just did, I just did a, a, a bucket list. I, I just did my show in Nashville with the Nashville session players, and we videotaped it and recorded it at the, at, the, at the legendary Oceanway Studios there with a small invited audience, 90-minute show 
of me doing my show, and we're going it, to, it, it's going to be a special law. Uh, we're, we're shopping it now. We, who knows? Uh, Netflix, Hulu. You're right. Uh, one of those entities. Uh, uh, we haven't decided yet. Uh, but uh, so between, I have a, just a regular album coming out, and I have that show coming out. Yeah, it's called Song Stories and Out and Out Lies. Uh, Ronnie, I mean, uh, how many dates do you do a year in, on, on on average? Would but, you... Normally around 100, wow. 150. Holy mackerel. Yeah, pretty pretty much for an old guy. <laughs> well, well, you still bring a lot of joy, not only through your music. Of course, we're not doing many these days, you know. <laughs> right, right, I know, I know. So, yeah, well, you, you know, now I, guess... I was supposed to be I was supposed to be in New Jersey uh, just about now doing one of those autograph they one of those autograph shows uh, uh had hired us to come and play and and do the stuff and that it's been put off i don't still don't i don't know if we'll do it it's been put off until halloween weekend wow but you you have a youtube channel you play some music on as well i, I, I remind your people that my name is spelled r o n n y <laughs> <laughs> Is there somebody else with an I in it? Well, 90% of the people in the world think Ronnie is spelled R-O-N-N-I-E. And it's not. It's R-O-N-N-I-E is the nickname for Veronica. I did. In the words of the great Johnny Carson, I I did not know that. I did not know that. (laughs) I I didn't know. R-O-N-N-Y. R-O-N-N-Y, yeah. Go to RonnieCox.com. You can you can listen to, to any of the stuff I got, or or go to my website. I mean, go to Facebook. Uh, Ronnie, this has been a joy for me because I'm a big fan of you. Real quick, what do you like to play better, the good guy or the bad guy? I'm sorry. What do you like to play better, the good guy or the bad guy? Oh, the bad guys are about twenty times more fun to play. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's about it's a, being a good. I try to be a good person every moment of my life. Right. It, that that's boring. Here's the thing about good guys. They always make the right choice. They always do the right yeah, they're thing. They're boring. It's boring as hell. Yeah. Now, the bad guys, and by the way, the bad guys always think, if you just, if everybody just could see what they could see, they'd, they'd be straightening themselves out and then know that it's right. So I'd much rather play the bad guy. Yeah, it's, it seems to be the consensus, Ronnie, because everybody asks that question to them. Oh, I want to play the bad guy. Screw the, screw the good yeah. guy. That's funny. I don't know. I don't good. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's just it's nothing to it. Ronnie, this has been great. And continue that, success. That, and um, guys, visit. That, 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 what's that? If I'm playing a good guy, I look for every rough edge of him to play. Every every flaw, I try to point that. And and if I'm playing the ba- the, the, the the bad guy, I look for everything that makes him seem like a good guy to himself, at least. <laughs> great acting advice from a great actor, and uh, Ronnie, one of the greats. And guys, go out and check out his music on RonnieCox.com. R O N N Y C O X dot com. One of the good guys in the business. And uh, Ronnie, thank you so much for this, and continue success. And we will uh, talk to you soon. Thank you. All right. God bless. Bye. Bye-bye. All right, right.